When Russia's TOS-1 Buratino system was first deployed by Putin's army against Ukraine, the news and human rights organizations sounded the alarms. With recent news that the center part of the city of Bakhmut has been captured by Russia, it's worth taking a look at the brutal weapon system they deployed in order to destroy and control this part of the city. In early April 2023, that's when we first started hearing reports that Russia had deployed the TOS-1A to Bakhmut, and I think this signaled a turning point in the battle, one where we saw Russia pivoting from capturing the city to flat out leveling it. If they can't have it, no one can. The British Defense Ministry cited Russian media reports about the transfer of the TOS-1A to Moscow's airborne forces, the VDV, on April 3rd, 2023. There's different opinions about the impact of this weapon system. Some say it didn't make that much of a difference, others say it would have been impossible to capture the city without it. It's most effective as a shock weapon against troops in trenches and defending urban areas. But there's a problem that we're gonna get into today. Thermobaric weaponry does not exist within a strictly defined legal framework like other types of weapons of war. If you look at nuclear weapons, landmines, chemical weapons, and certain type of bullets, they all have hard codifications when it comes to their legality. The TOS-1A is able to kind of slip through the cracks and not fit into one of these prohibited weapon classifications. The TOS-1, with its 30 rocket pods, has a bit of an identity crisis. It's actually classified as a quote-unquote heavy flamethrower by the Russian Ministry of Defense and fires a 220 millimeter rocket from a heavily armored tank chassis. The weapon fills a unique role in the Russian military that's part artillery and part close support weapon. While it looks like your conventional multiple launch rocket system, the TOS-1 is actually much shorter ranged than most of those platforms. Its tactics are designed to get up close and personal with thermobaric quote unquote vacuum bombs or incendiary warheads. So what about this weapon has everyone so concerned? Why did a Russian colonel claim that Western militaries have no counterpart to the system? And what even is a vacuum bomb anyway? But first, I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, non-firing collectible goods guns. These models are one-third scale replicas made from die-cast metal, and they're accurate down to the smallest detail. I've personally talked with the creators and found out it's actually taken them years to perfect these designs. And that's because it's made by people who actually care about the type of things that matter to us in the military community, like realistic slides, magazines, and dummy rounds. They're the perfect gift and they come in really nice packaging. Goat Guns has a wide selection of non-firing models from Soviet era or NATO. You can choose to customize your unique setup with a variety of different attachments, whether you're looking for a historical style AK-47 or an M1 Garand or a super tricked out modern grenade launcher. And Goat Guns are quality, durable products, weighing at a hefty 16 ounces. Just check out the over 15,000 five-star reviews on their website. And today, if you head over to GoatGuns.com, you'll get 10% off a pack of three and 20% off a pack of 10. You can support the channel by clicking the link in the description and grabbing your own non-firing replica today. The evolution of the heavy flamethrower as a concept dates back to World War II. Even light fortifications like trench lines and machine gun nests could delay in advance by hours or days. For example, during the siege of Sevastopol, concentric rings of heavy fortifications allowed Soviet defenders to hold out against multiple German attacks for eight months and four days. In just the last month of the siege, German forces expended nearly 47,000 tons of artillery ammunition to overcome the city's defenses. To counter entrenched positions, militaries in the 1970s and 80s increasingly relied on air and artillery, but this approach had two limitations. First, your regular artillery was slow to respond and still had trouble defeating the heaviest types of fortifications. Second, airstrikes required air superiority, which as we've seen is not a given. To fill this capability gap left behind after the retirement of flame tanks, the Soviet military began designing what would become the TOS-1 in the early 1980s. Development was carried out in secret at the KTBM Design Bureau inside the Russian city of Omsk, entering service in 1988 during the final years of the Soviet-Afghan War. Despite being used in combat trials in the Panjshir Valley of Afghanistan, the TOS-1 wasn't unveiled to the public for another 10 years. Because of this secrecy, not much is known about its early development history, but the nickname Buratino comes from the Russian translation for Pinocchio, as Russian designers thought the TOS-1 had a big nose. 
Key to the TOS 1's performance and the reason for all the secrecy around the weapons project is the Burutino's focus on using incendiary and thermobaric warheads at close range. The Russian military still has problems building precision guided weapons in 2023, and it was even more of a problem in the late 1980s, so bringing a rocket launcher closer to the target has the benefit of improving both accuracy and response time. The first version of the TOS 1 had a maximum range of about 3.5 kilometers far shorter than similar 220mm rocket systems like the BM-27, which fires out to 34 kilometers. This reflects the more direct support role of the TOS-1, bringing the firepower right up to the target for maximum effect. But being closer also makes the launcher more vulnerable to enemy fire and artillery. To offset this vulnerability, both the TOS-1 and its reloading vehicle were built using a fully armored T-72 tank hull for mobility and protection. All aiming and firing functions can be performed from inside the vehicle, so crew aren't exposed to the battlefield. And the TOS-1 can go from on the move to firing on a target within just 90 seconds, ensuring a quick response to requests for fire missions. The TOS-1 fires in an arc like most rocket artillery, so it has a minimum range of 400 meters. But this isn't seen as a problem by the designers, as the Buratino is still a fire support weapon and not an actual tank, despite using a T-72 chassis. The Buratino has the base layers of steel and composite armor of a T-72, but not the explosive reactive armor mounted on proper tanks that defend against infantry anti-tank weapons and ATGMs. Instead, the vehicle's armor protects against counter-battery artillery that may get fired against the distinctive launch signatures of the rocket tube. As we see, it kicks up smoke and makes all kinds of sound. It really has a strong signature. The TOS-1 doesn't just depend on its armor to keep it out of trouble either, but it is intended to work closely with troops on the ground, where infantry and tanks can cover the Burotino while the weapon unleashes massive firepower at anything giving the ground forces trouble. Speaking of massive firepower, we mentioned earlier that the Burotino can pack either incendiary or thermobaric warheads in its 220mm rockets, but it's most famous for that second option, thermobaric warheads. They work differently from your high explosive fragmentation warheads that most people typically think of when artillery or bombs are getting thrown around. Thermobaric munitions, also called fuel air bombs or vacuum bombs, don't just explode in one go. Instead, they set off a small primer explosive that scatters an explosive aerosol over a wide area. This aerosol mixes with the atmosphere before a second charge in the munition goes off and detonates all the surrounding particles that have been mixed with the air. Conventional high explosive combine with explosive compound with an oxidizer. So by using ambient air instead of thermobaric warheads, can pack more of a punch for the same weight. The longer burn time of the aerosolized fuel also generates a much stronger pressure wave than conventional high explosives, resulting in tremendously powerful shock waves. That alone can be lethal. The nickname vacuum bomb comes from the way the explosion sucks the oxygen out of the air in a wide radius. This powerful vacuum effect and the following rush of air makes a one-two punch that can rupture the lungs of anyone unfortunate enough to be near the explosive. This thermobaric effect works well on targets in the open, but it's uniquely suited to tackling heavy fortifications and infantry in buildings. The fraction of a second between the first and second charges going off allows the fuel-air mixture to penetrate openings and cracks in buildings before full detonation, while the follow-on vacuum reaction is especially deadly in tight confines of tunnels and basements. The US Army's World Equipment Guide cites the initial shock wave and reverse waves to be as strong as 427 pounds per square inch of force, enough to rip soft materials like aircraft skin or internal organs, while the long burn time of the explosion generates heat up to 3,000 degrees Celsius. Other militaries make use of thermobaric explosives as well, with the US most famous thermobaric weapons being airdrop bombs like the Vietnam era Blue 82 Daisy Cutter that flatten forests, or the modern GBU-43 mother of all bombs. These gigantic bombs created explosions as large as the smallest tactical nuclear weapons equivalent to 11 tons of TNT in the MOAB's case. So the American military has used these massive weapons 
only sparingly, to clear the deep tunnel networks of an Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. The US went a different route by introducing a version of the AGM-114 Hellfire missile with a thermobaric warhead. Though much smaller than the 3.7 meter rockets of the TOS-1, the Hellfire can be guided precisely onto the target, a tunnel or cave entrance in this case, meaning US helicopters could fulfill the anti-fortification mission in a much more accurate and expensive style. The TOS-1 weighs 46 tons, travels at 60 kilometers per hour on road, and carries 30 rockets, while the newer TOS-1A packs 24 rockets, has a slightly longer range of about 6 kilometers compared to the previous version's 3.5 kilometers. Each rocket overall weighs about 217 kilograms, and only about 45 of those kilograms are dedicated to the actual explosive warhead. The launcher can fire rockets individually, in pairs, or a full salvo of all rockets in the tubes within 7.5 to 12 seconds. The 3.7 meter long rockets are unguided, but the vehicle has an electronic ballistic computer and laser rangefinder that improve accuracy, meaning a full salvo of thermobaric or incendiary munitions saturates an area of assured destruction measuring 200 by 400 meters. This is characteristic of the Russian way of war that favors saturation tactics to create corridors of cleared terrain that troops can use to create a breakthrough in enemy lines. If enemy troops survive the initial artillery barrage by hiding in tunnels or bunkers, Russian commanders can bring in the Buratino to deal with the problem and pave the way for troops to advance. The Western approach of using bombs and Hellfire missiles is a result of the reliable expectations of air power and precision guided technologies being available when needed, which is why most thermobaric weapons in the US military are deployed by air to make use of these advantages. The Soviets and Russian militaries knew that they couldn't guarantee air superiority in the case of a hot war with NATO, and they had less air power to call upon overall. The TOS-1 is the Russian answer to the fortification problem that doesn't rely on having air superiority to serve its purpose. While it may not be a flamethrower in the way that we in the West think of one, the Russians give it the special treatment because it serves the same anti-fortification function, and the Russian military of defense assigns the vehicle to be specialized nuclear, biological, and chemical battalions instead of infantry or armor formations like normal artillery. And Russian commanders seem especially fond of the Borotino, as we'll see. Combat history, legality, and controversies. After its combat trials in the valleys of Afghanistan, the TOS-1 remained a secret weapon with only limited production numbers until it was publicly unveiled in 1999 at the 3rd International Omsk Exhibition of Ground and Air Equipment. The Second Chechen War broke out in August of that year, and the TOS-1 was deployed to the front lines. The Berutino gained a brutal reputation in Chechnya, where it was used in the heavy bombardment of the city of Grozny. Chechen fighters were experts at urban warfare, laying mines and booby-trapping everything while making excellent use of buildings to protect themselves and mask their movements, so they could ambush Russian forces. After heavy losses, including the loss of an entire armored column in the square, the Russian military besieged the city, pounding it with TOS-1 thermobaric rockets along with conventional artillery, completely leveling the whole city. In 2003, the UN declared Grozny the most destroyed city on Earth, with estimated civilian casualties between 5,000 and 8,000, although an ongoing guerrilla war meant inspectors were never able to conduct a full count, so the true number could be much higher. In spite of the heavy civilian casualties, or maybe because of it, the Russians were very happy with the TOS-1's performance, incorporating lessons learned from the Second Chechen War into a new version called the TOS-1A, Solovetsky, that entered full production in 2001. In addition to the longer range rockets, the TOS-1 upgraded the launch vehicle to either a T-72B3 or a T-90S chassis for better protection and mobility. Now, out of the prototyping stage, the TOS-1A has two main vehicles, the BM-1 launching vehicle and the TZMT reloading vehicle, along with a command post vehicle and a maintenance truck. The reloading vehicle is just as heavily armored as the launcher, carrying two pods with rockets, each to reload the launch vehicle with an attached crane. 
an experienced crew can fully reload the launch vehicle within 30 minutes. Though the reloading operation has been done from outside the vehicle's armor, meaning the vehicles have to pull back from the front lines after each salvo to reload. With the vehicle in full production, the TOS-1 was also purchased by Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iraq, Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia. The TOS-1 continued to build on its fearsome, reputation for widespread destruction of urban areas, especially during the Syrian civil war, where Russians and Syrian government forces had used the system to raise entire neighborhoods. The Battle of Aleppo, for example, sometimes called Syria's Stalingrad, saw 30,000 buildings destroyed by a variety of weapons, including the TOS-1A. With such heavy firepower aimed at urban areas, the civilian death toll was even higher than Grozny. The 31,000 killed in this one battle, the Violations Documentation Center of Syria estimates 76% of its casualties were civilians. With such a record of destroying cities, Western militaries and human rights groups sounded the alarm when the TOS-1A was cited joining the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. There have been rumors of the system being in limited use during the 2014 war in Donbass. But the system's return during a full-scale invasion signaled a new phase in Russia's strategy after Ukraine spoiled their plans for a swift three-day victory. The use of thermobaric weapons, included by the US, has been heavily criticized by human rights groups and international arms control organizations because of their high potential for collateral damage. It's a common myth that thermobaric and incendiary weapons are banned by the Geneva Convention. But Protocol 3 of the Convention on Conventional Weapons only restricts their use against civilians or near civilian infrastructure, a prohibition that has been routinely stretched by Russia and other countries anyway. The language of existing treaties is also outdated, only focusing on airdrop munitions, and it isn't clearly stated if thermobaric weapons count as incendiary weapons or not. Efforts to strengthen and expand restrictions against incendiary and thermobaric weapons routinely just get shot down by major powers like the United States and Russia, who argue their military utility is just too great to fully ban their use against military targets. While the imprecise language of existing treaties give militaries the wiggle room that they depend on when collateral damage does happen. While the international debate rages in the background, Russia once again is using their TOS-1 rockets on civilian population centers in Ukraine. Russia's plan B, after their initial blitz strategy failed, was to use the same siege tactics that they used in Grozny and Aleppo against Ukraine, with the TOS-1A joining mass artillery barrages of Ukrainian defensive positions, whether they were in cities or not. This is most recently evident in the city of Bakhmut, which is one of the cities that was characterized as being destroyed by Ukrainian authorities. Preliminary estimates from May 2023 are that 350,000 buildings have been destroyed in Ukraine since the February 2022 invasion, along with millions of square kilometers of civilian property and infrastructure. During the Battle of Bakhmut, which lasted over nine months and was just captured by Russia, we think, on May 21st, the TOS-1A was attached to the VDV paratrooper battalions as they assisted Wagner PMC mercenaries in the meter by meter fighting through the ruins of the city. The battle made extensive use of the TOS-1A's thermobaric and incendiary rockets, with the hardest hit regions of the city being compared to no man's land from World War I. At first glance, the lengthy battle in Bakhmut might seem like it contradicts the TOS-1A's effectiveness since fighting through heavily fortified areas and urban terrain are supposed to be the weapon's strong suits. But the slow slog through the city likely has more to do with the disorganized state of the Russian offensive than anything that these weapon systems can make up for. Fighting for the city and its outskirts was split between Russian military units of varying quality and Wagner mercenaries, each of them distrusting each other. Yevgeny Prigozhin, who's in charge of the Wagner PMC group, routinely placed the blame for heavy casualties, along with his lack of ammunition for his artillery units that he blamed on the Ministry of Defense. A lot of this is likely bluster to try and divert away from the fact that there hasn't been much progress. Prigozhin is trying to push the blame away from himself and his company, but there might be an element of 
truth that the Russian military couldn't or wouldn't provide the necessary artillery support to the TOS-1 system. Because of this weapon system's destructive potential, we've seen how the TOS-1A is considered a priority target by Ukrainian forces. In a tweet from April 6, 2022, the Odessa OVA claimed that Ukrainian forces were actually able to capture one of these systems in Izium and fire it back at Russian troops. Though the fog of war, it's unknown exactly how many units have been able to capture these by Ukraine, but at least one has been visually confirmed destroyed near Voldar, and the Ukrainian military claims to have captured at least four abandoned units during the early stages of the war. The Russian armed forces were believed to have around 45 units before the invasion, but there are reports of production starting up again in September and November of this year, with an unspecified number of units being produced. The TOS-1 Baratino and its latest versions are terrifying fire support weapons that Russia uses against urban centers. It's nice to see Ukrainians firing some back at the Russian occupiers to get a taste of their own medicine. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. That's all I have on this net. Time now.